Okay, uh, thank you so much um, for the invitation to be here, Leslie and Omar. It's a real honor, I'm delighted. As Leslie noted, um, the intersections between arts and sciences are very near and dear to my heart, so it's an especial honor to be here. Okay, so this evening, I uh, would like to propose to you that if we want to understand how our immune systems work, why they succeed as often as they do, and why they appear to fail us from time to time, we need to take a deep time look at the evolution of our immune systems. Essentially, uh, understanding all the way back almost to the primordial soup, how our immune defense mechanisms were cultivated very deeply back in biological time, and that determines how well they are deployed now so we're sort of moving from the primordial soup to the teeming metropolis in the course of this evening's lecture. I want to acknowledge, though, straight up front, that when I say deep time, I'm not talking back to the Big Bang, right? I'm not talking astronomical uh, time scales necessarily. My immunology work, I guess I'm very uh, narrow-minded as a biologist. I tend to focus on earthlings. So um, it, it will be rather deep time in terms of being rather far back, but perhaps surprisingly far back in geological time and biological time that we'll travel, but it's not astronomical time. So what do I mean when I say we're going deep in geological and, and biological time? This is uh, one of my favorite graphics representing uh, when humans appeared on the scene relative to the um, when Earth uh, first formed. So Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago, and this, this plot is meant to show that if uh, Earth was formed about at the shoulder, you have to go all the way down the arm to the middle of the palm before animals evolved. Okay, there's a whole bunch of Earth history where there's just a bunch of single-celled organisms around the place. Animals, sort of the middle of the palm, lots of diversification, dinosaurs, lots of wonderful charismatic animals came and went. Humans um, are just at the very tip of the very last bit of the fingernail, right? Our time on Earth is very short compared to uh, that long view of, of Earth history. What I'm going to argue to you tonight is that we need to go back about to this point, certainly very deep into the in biological time before multicellular organisms even existed on Earth to really understand how our immune systems work. And the main thing that I want you to take away tonight is that these ancient evolved defenses uh, that we have work best in the presence of ancient friends who happen to be, most of my work uh, focuses on, parasitic worms. So this is a view uh, down a microscope of a human blood film. So blood was taken from a human host, smeared on a slide, and then examined under the microscope at about 40-fold power in the original magnification. Of course, the worm is terrifyingly much larger than that now. Um, but that is an example of the ancient friends with whom our immune systems uh, collaborate quite effectively. The structure of the rest of my talk is going to be as follows. It's going to be uh, in four main parts. So the first two parts will be first a motivational um, aspect to tell you why I think thinking about immune systems in deep time can help to explain our vulnerability to uh, diseases today. The second part of the talk, and this will be a sizable component, is that I want you to come away as excited about how amazing our immune system cells are as I am. I want you to really get a visceral sense of what these cells are capable of. Um, they have ancient powers, so powers that have evolved over a very long time uh, um, in the history on Earth. Uh, but they also pose perils. Some of the activities that these cells undertake on behalf of our bodies pose peril as well. So I will, I will outline those in the second part of the talk. Before I move on to the third part, which is really where the environmental change piece comes in. The idea that the loss of old friends in modern environments as we move into the teeming metropolis and lose some of our, our parasitic worms that seems to be shifting our immune responses in the direction of greater peril. 
and I'll conclu conclude with a synopsis about how this perspective helps to explain some of our variation in disease vulnerability, uh, one person to the next, one society to the next, and potentially how this could inform medicine. Okay, so motivational piece. So I'm certainly interested in basic science research, science for its own sake, biological discoveries, but I'm also motivated to understand human vulnerability to infectious and inflammatory diseases. So there's a real medical uh, bent to, uh, to my work as well. So for example, one question that drives a lot of immunological research uh, um, by both biomedical and evolutionary immunologists is a scene like this. We've all been on the subway and someone sneezes violently and doesn't cover it properly. And um, so a lot of people are exposed, but only a few of those sneezer, those who are sneezed upon become sneezers themselves. What I mean is only a few of the people who are exposed uh, go on to develop a, a heavy infection. Um, and why is that? Is it something about their genes that makes people more vulnerable to this infectious disease? It is, is it something about the environment or their condition or their mood or, you know, what is it? Is it some combination of these things? We certainly think that genetic and environmental influences on their immune systems will be important explanations for why only some of these people will catch the cold. So I'm very interested in heterogeneity, in susceptibility to a disease, even when hosts are exposed to a very similar risk. An equally important statement, though, that demands explanation is this one. Millions of people suffer septic shock or other auto, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. And I really want to understand why this is. Um, septic shock is uh, detailed over in this cartoon on the left. Basically, sepsis is when um, bacteria emerge, especially into the bloodstream, often from the gut. Uh, and the immune system's strong reaction to that is what actually makes us really, really sick. So the bacteria are an important trigger. The immune system needs to respond, but the uh, body's own response to that infection, to the bacteria in the blood, is what risks death. And 18 million people per year uh, undergo sepsis, and about 8 million of them die. It is a very major cause of uh, mortality in, in people, immune overreactions to a bacterial challenge. But there are many, many other examples affecting lots of different tissues. Probably everybody in the room knows someone who has an autoimmune disease. And I, as an evolutionary biologist, came into immunology via these sorts of observations. I thought, if we have this wonderful pinnacle of adaptive evolution immune system, what is it doing killing so many people? So I, I am very interested in answering why this, uh, this holds true. And my approach is to look to the cells. I think the double-edged cells of our immune system hold the answers. And when I say double-edged, I mean that they convey a lot of uh, protective power. They have a lot of skills that help protect us against infection. But those same molecules that they use to fight off infection can cause a lot of harm to our own tissues. So if we're looking, for example, here, this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of a macrophage, which is one of, the, uh, one of the amazing cell types of our immune system. In this case, it's a colorized micrograph. People often colorize these because I guess they think they, the cells look even more charming when they're tinted like this. Um, but all, this macrophage has been activated to um, try to attack uh, Borrelia. So these are the spirochetes that would cause Lyme disease. So this is a macrophage, you know, very much. We're on side with this macrophage trying to prevent us uh, getting Lyme disease. But if the macrophage overdoes its inflammatory reaction to Lyme disease, that can make us even sicker than we would be with the bacterium alone. This is a scanning uh, transmission electron micrograph of a plasma cell, which is the antibody secretion specialist of the immune system. And you could make an analogous argument for the power and the peril of that cell when it's really cranking out antibodies. So I think these cells, when you delve into the biology of the cells and understand the evolution of the, the, the ways in which these cells help us to fight infection, we really can get deeply into questions such as, why does our species suffer inflammatory disease? Why do we have that vulnerability to begin with? 
And B, why do we vary so much one person to the next in whether, when, and how we get sick, whether it's an infectious disease, an inflammatory disease, or a cancer, which is definitely on the spectrum here of diseases to be explained by the immune system. Okay, so I'm motivated to answer those kinds of questions by digging into the cell biology, but now I want to try to uh, bring you on board with what I've called the wow factor, to really understand how amazing the cells of our immune system are and how they have these deep time origins in life on Earth. So when I try to get people excited about the immune system, I often find myself talking about like mythical beings or that sort of thing. In this case, I've picked the, some Marvel comic characters because the immune system, like the X-Men, includes a cast of characters that um, is, is it's quite a deep bench in terms of having lots and lots of different skills that they can bring to the task. Uh, so different superheroes have different special powers that they can unleash against the bad guys. Uh, and they're very impressive in their, and powerful in their ability to do so. Well, so too for the cells of the immune system. In fact, so much so that it was hard for me to choose which one to focus on in particular for tonight. Uh, but in the end, I decided upon neutrophils because they really, really do have a lot of amazing superpowers. So when you first look at them, they may not seem all that impressive, but bear with me and I think you'll, I think you'll share my enthusiasm. So um, these are fields of view, again, down the microscope into um, blood smears taken from uh, human hosts. And these sort of gray blobby guys um, are the red blood cells that because of the stain, they end up looking kind of lavenderish gray. Um, the magnification in this case is about 100x in the original uh, micrographs. And so um, this neutrophil, which is right here in this field of red blood cells, is about 10 microns across. And there are 1,000 microns in a millimeter, in case that helps you get a sense of what the size is here. Okay, so these are tiny guys. Um, this is a neutrophil, it classically stains like this. People have also made movies, especially David Rogers back in the 1950s made movies down the microscope, which are of course much more dynamic and impressive, but they don't project very well. I highly encourage you to look on YouTube if you get a neutrophil uh, fascination after tonight. And you can watch this neutrophil. You can see that it's not confining itself to this round shape. It is a very dynamic, and in fact, it is a, an amoeboid cell. It is a cell that can crawl and swim through our blood. Uh, with great grace. And so that's exactly what this neutrophil is doing. It is chasing bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus bacteria, through this field of view. And what it does is it eats it. So neutrophils are among the, the specialists in our bodies that, un, that do phagocytosis. They are phagocytes, they are cells that eat, or cells that devour, based on the Greek roots, phago and cyte, cells that devour. Okay, so um, the fact that I said these are, are amoeboid cells, these neutrophils, is important because that is a connection to the broader biology on Earth that I want to point out to you. Basically, the ways in which these cells move and the ways in which they eat bacteria in our bodies are directly homologous with the ways in which amoebae feed in the, in the free living world. So this cartoon I thought was wonderful because this is capturing the fact that an amoeba, so a free-living, single-celled amoeba that you'd find in the East River or the reservoir in Central Park, um, uh, is known for its ability to phagocytize, to eat things, okay? And basically what this person, Beatrice the biologist, is cartooning is that if you happen to be a little cell, like a tiny little bacterium that gets in to a hug with an amoeba, you're most likely going to die because the amoeba um, is, is extending a cup around the, the microbe and then ingests it and the amoeba is happy and the, and the little green guy is not. So amoeba hugs are often fatal and this is absolutely the case. This is a, uh, a micrograph of an amoeba, so this is not a neutrophil, this is, the kind, this is a true amoeba that you'd find in the reservoir in Central Park. Look, it's giving a hug to something that will not be long for this world, okay? So amoebae forage by um, 
basically extending parts of their cytoskeleton, just as we have skeletons in our bodies, cells have skeletons too, composed of different um, structural elements, but the cytoskeleton mobilizes to enable it to hug what it will ultimately eat. The two arms come together and form a, 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 a digestive compartment that, in which the, the, that thing will be destroyed. Okay. Yes, so amoeba hugs are essential to phagocytosis, this devouring by cells. This is a cartoon of that same thing. Here's the hug. The, the traditional um, word for this is pseudopodium, these projections that the amoeboid cells send out to surround the food or other things it's going to ingest, and it puts them in, the, in a food vacuole, and that becomes lunch. The amoeba will digest what's in that food vacuole. This is a uh, uh, transmission electron, electron micrograph of a side view of a, an amoeba that was really ambitious, and it was eating a bacterium that is about its own volume. And it turns out that they can do that. They can really co contort themselves to wrap those hugs of the arm around and ingest the whole thing. People have done the weight and volume studies and shown that an amoeba can eat its own weight in bacteria in one, in one go. And what they do once it's inside, once the food is inside there, they digest it aerobically. So basically they, they, they burn it up using oxidative metabolism. Okay, now let's get back to the immune system. The reason I'm telling you all of this is that the cytoskeleton movements and many other components of this process are highly conserved and deployed by cells of our own bodies in defense against infection. I'm gonna show you this in a couple of different ways to, to make this point. First, I'm starting with um, one of the first trees of life, uh, Hegel's animal phylogeny, which he drew in 1874. Um, it is basically just the f one of the first representations of the relatedness among all, all species on Earth. Um, and down here at the bottom, there's the amoebae right there, second from the bottom. And then it gets up through invertebrate animals and vertebrate animals. And of course, man is at the top. We are here. Um, this is uh, no doubt anthropocentric, possibly uh, imperialist and all of that. But it is nonetheless, uh, it was a real advance to think about the relatedness among all life forms on Earth. And I'm using it as the backdrop to project that Phagocytosis and oxidative respiration, the way that the cells that phagocytose bacteria can then digest those bacteria and, and run, use them to run their own energetic budgets, that all evolved way, way back at the very base of this tree. That's basic cell biology, the very first steps outside of the primordial soup. And then what's, I think, equally amazing is that as soon as multicellular organisms evolve, so sponges, for example, and corals for sure, those same cell biological tricks, phagocytosis and then burning up what you eat inside those vacuoles, um, that has been used in organismal defense. So basically sponges and corals use cells that eat bacteria to patrol their bodies as well. To show you this in a slightly different way, um, this is now uh, a plot, um, again, with a long time axis. So here we are in the present, and then we're going back millions, uh, thousands of millions of years, in fact, right to the beginning of, of Earth history. And complexity is what's on the y-axis. So what you can see is that the unicellular world has dominated over mo much of this, uh, nearly all of this time, in fact, um, where um, two different kinds of bacteria, so-called eubacteria as well as the archaea, and single-cell eukaryotes, which are uh, cells that have um, subcellular structures within them. Um, those have been around for ages, phagocytosing, you know, eating bacteria and making a living that way, for example. And the multicellular animals and plants and such only have come very, sort of dawdled onto the scene more like 500 uh, million years ago. And again, to plot those phagocytic pieces onto this timeline, cells acquired phagocytic ability, oh, right around in here. In fact, people think that the way in which 
subcellular structures came about is that one cell ate another cell, and the cell that it ate became its organelle. Multicellular animals started co-opting that ancient phagocytic ability very early on in the multicellular tree of life. So we're talking very old cell biology used in defense of all multicellular animals. Okay, now let's get back to neutrophils and think about how they behave in our body. So neutrophils are extremely important in the inflammatory response, which means that when you get a cut or a scrape, that uh, redness and swelling and heat that kicks in as you're starting to heal, neutrophils are absolutely central to that process. And what's going on is this. Neutrophils are circulating in the blood. Here they are with those red blood cells again. Remember, they kept being smeared alongside the red cells in those, those micrographs. Here they are um, circulating through the blood. When they start getting signals, chemo um, signals, chemical signals, that there's a site of injury or infection, they slow down, they start sticking to the wall, and when they really get to the source of the problem, they get a really strong signal, this is where the infection is, they squeeze themselves out of the blood vessel in between the cells and into the tissue where they will eat the bacteria that are present. So they, they leave the circulation, enter the tissue, and there they will do their devouring of microbes. And this is one of the most amazing colorized neutrophil photos I think I've ever seen. They do devour microbes. This is a neutrophil now colorized uh, purple in a scanning electron micrograph. But again, this cell, especially this broad bit here, is around 10 microns or so, 10 to 15 microns in diameter. And what this one is eating is a colorized yeast cell. So this is a cell of candida or thrush. This is the kind of yeast that causes thrush infections. And here we have this great photo of a neutrophil ingesting, giving a hug to that yeast cell, and that yeast cell will become the, the next meal for this neutrophil. OK, so the neutrophils squeeze out of the blood into the tissue and eat what they find there. But that's not all. They have even better superpowers than that. The microbes that infect us are really diverse in size and shape. So unlike that yeast cell, which is sort of small and round, uh, perhaps e uh, easily wrangled, um, it's easy to find examples of bacteria, as, as cartooned here, but also other microbes that infect us that are much bigger and more awkwardly shaped. You know, some of these are incredibly awkwardly shaped. And it turns out that neutrophils can handle that too. This is another scanning electron micrograph. This time the neutrophil's been colored yellow, just for um, uh, further uh, excitement. Um, and the anthrax bacteria are now what are the neutrophil is attacking, so they're colorized orange. So bacillus anthrax, it's a really nasty infectious disease, certainly could kill. But if you have a neutrophil on your side, look how that neutrophil is able to basically do what that amoeba had done to the bacterium that it was about its same body size. This single neutrophil can stretch itself around and ingest the entirety of these very long, skinny, awkwardly shaped bacteria and digest them and thereby protect, uh, protect us from that kind of infection. But there's one more superpower that I want you to know about and that is that when the neutrophil does find something that is just too big for it to eat, it has another power that it unleashes. It deploys nets, neutrophil extracellular traps. Basically what it does, a neutrophil that perceives an object that is too big for it to eat, too big for the phagocytic arms to get round, Basically, it condenses its nuclear material, degrades it, pushes it up to the edge of the cell membrane, and spews it out. And it attaches to it noxious chemicals. So what happens is that the thing that was too big to be eaten gets caught in this trap of noxious chemicals. Of course, the neutrophil dies in the process. It kills itself when it spews out its DNA. But it's quite an incredible, I mean, you know, Spider-Man was doing things like that too, right? So it really is like a superhero maneuver when the enemy demands it. And we can just return for one moment uh, to the candida example, that thrush causing uh, yeast. What's shown up here are the single cell 
morphs of that yeast. So during some phases in the life cycle of the yeast, it only has single cells, and there are a bunch of them there. In this case, the scale bar is 50 microns, so they're, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty small. But this bottom panel shows what, what's called hyphae. When the fungus basically sprouts and makes long filaments of itself, see, that's a 50 micron bar. These are absolutely gigantically long pieces of fungus that are too big for the neutrophil to eat. What does the neutrophil do? Throws nets. Throws nets that are capable of killing the fungus externally. OK, so I think that illustrates the wow factor in terms of the power of a cell like a neutrophil to help fight off uh, infection. It can eat lots of things, even awkwardly shaped things. And if they get too big, it eviscerates itself and throws a, a, a toxic net out to kill the pathogen. That's all pretty impressive in defense against infection. But what about the perils? I haven't told you yet about the perils. So one, one of the perils harkens back to something I've already told you about how they digest, but now I'll lay, put one layer onto it. Basically, neutrophils use quite hazardous substances inside their, their, um, those food vacuoles. Uh, this is just showing bacterium. Here we go, phagocytosis. You guys know the drill now. And now here we have the bacterium inside this food vacuole. The main thing I want to point out is, first of all, hydrogen peroxide like actual chemical hydrogen peroxide, like you might apply externally to your wounds, is deployed inside a neutrophil. But also lots of other chemical um, elements that are um, unstable. They're free radicals that can do a lot of oxidative damage. So this is great for digesting bacteria, but if it leaches out, then that can cause a lot of harm to the host uh, itself. So for example, if a neutrophil has a, has, is full of um, digested bacteria, but then needs to spew its DNA out, it is also spewing out a whole bunch of hydrogen peroxide and free radicals into the host's tissue. And that can cause a, an awful lot of damage. So the mo these molecules damage many targets. They can um, break DNA, they can destroy the lipid membranes of cells, so basically burst cells open, and they can destroy proteins, among other targets. So this is a very dangerous thing when a neutrophil's chemicals leak out. But most dangerous of all, returning to the septic shock example that I outlined earlier, when neutrophils leave the blood vessels en masse, like large numbers of them get excited and they co uh, move out together, from the blood circulation out into the tissue, um, that is life-threatening. So to orient you, this is a, another view of neutrophils moving through the blood system and then moving into tissues. It's a more abstract view because it's showing when tissues break down. So this is a neutrophil that's getting the signal that there's an infection down here, and it's getting ready to squeeze out, squeeze out of the blood vessel into the tissue to fight the infection. Um, but what's happening is it's piling up with a whole bunch of other neutrophils that are all squeezing through your blood vessels. And guess what else squeezes through your blood vessels? Your red blood cells start squeezing out. Basically, this can cause a catastrophic loss of blood pressure. If too much of this is going on, your blood leaves your blood system. And that is what really puts people at risk of organ failure. So that is what happens in the 8 million deaths over here. Loss of blood, basically. Okay, so this neutrophil could save your life if it's gonna eat the anthrax, but a whole crowd of them getting overexcited and leaving your blood together um, can put you at risk of septic shock. So this is very dangerous indeed. So an evolutionary biologist thinking about these wonderful benefits of having neutrophils on your side versus the great risks that they pose, uh, thinks about it in this way. Um, so. Um, the, the benefits will include, you know, protection against infectious diseases. The costs of having that neutrophil defense system include risk of septic shock, okay? So evolutionarily, there's this one-to-one -one line projected on the diagonal of this plot, and we call this the evolutionary limit because it is, it is expected that natural selection will not favor anything that ends up being more costly than beneficial, right? On balance, the, um, it has to do more good than harm. So it has to be below this line in order for natural selection to favor and ultimately maintain a trait. 
So what that means is that um, as long as you're getting more benefit than cost of having a neutrophil arm to your immune system, um, we can understand why it's been maintained by natural selection. But also, if you go up this dashed line, you can see that this, these, this represents, say, hosts who differ in genotype or differ in environment, differ in their genetics or their environment, such that everybody's getting a certain benefit, but look how the cost can escalate, right? As long as it doesn't go above the evolutionary limit where it becomes so costly that it will not be preserved in, in the population over deep time, then a lot, of, a lot of costs can be tolerated in evolutionary systems. And we think this helps to explain why we have such peril in our immune cells. Now, one key point I want to make before I shift to the, uh, the explicit environment piece of this uh, talk is that a change in environment is very capable of changing the cost-benefit ratio that a host experiences. So a host has its fixed genetics, right? But if it moves from environment A to environment B, or let's say environment one to environment two, just to be consistent with this, it can, it's still getting a lot of benefit of the trait, but if it's in environment one, it's paying this rather low cost, C1, but environment two, the cost escalates. Potentially, in the case of inflammatory diseases, that environmental shift means the inflammatory price is much higher for having um, physically, sorry, the inflammatory disease price of having really good infectious disease protection is higher in environment two. So we'll think about that some more in the coming minutes. Okay, so the context, the environmental context in which I and my collaborators think about this is uh, basically some of the greatest successes of public health may have in some senses have gone too far. Are we too clean for our genes? So this is now a classic epidemiological study um, from uh, 2002, New England Journal of Medicine, reporting the observation that as we've succeeded in, um, in the second half of the, uh, the 20th century in clearing so many infectious diseases from the population, with parasites, my favorite guys here, boldly in red, uh, but lots of other ones too. We've declined those with public health interventions like clean water and vaccination, lots of wonderful stuff. But as that's happened, look what has happened over that same time interval to the incidence of immune disorders such as Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes. People have long observed this and now people are starting to argue that this is causal, that especially decline in the parasites that we have co-evolved with over millions of years, we are becoming more and more susceptible to paying a high inflammatory cost for our immune systems. So let's think about that further. How modern environments where we have too few parasites can shift the cost-benefit ratio for inflammation. Basically, we pay a higher price for having a given level of uh, defense against infection. And in particular, we're pushing the balance towards peril, a perilous immune responses as we lose what we call old friends. Now, that may not roll off the tongue for some of you, the idea of parasites as our old friends. So I want to address why I argue they are our old, our old friends. This is another look at deep evolutionary time, a rather different way of plotting it, but bear with me, please. Okay, so the punchline here is that our immune systems, right from the start, evolved in symbiosis with particularly parasitic worms. So neutrophils are, are truly ancient. This is way back in time, um, like 600 million years ago for sure, vertebrates had neutrophils, okay? Um, then we're moving along in time out here and the mammals didn't even appear on Earth till bottom right here, okay? Okay, what this is showing is that um, parasitic platyhelminths, flatworms, uh, like liver flukes, perhaps you've heard of those. Those appeared um, right around 550 million years ago in association with vertebrates. Right around the same time, T cells and B cells evolved. A little while later, when vertebrates colonized land, we got nematodes too. So parasitic uh, nematodes parasitized um, uh, our, our ancestors around 400 million years ago. So 
Only much later did birds evolve and mammalia finally. Our little burst here is showing we do have some specialized antibody subsets that we have all to ourselves as mammals, but basically we share the rest of our armament with all of these different animals down the tree of life. And worms have been there for hundreds of millions of years, at least 400 million years. And the reason I say friends is that they help us modulate our immune system. So on Earth today, over a billion people still have worms in their bodies, especially in their gastrointestinal tracts, in their guts, but also in their blood. And there's a website with real-time information on just how wormy the world is, thiswormyworld.org. Certainly people who have a very heavy worm burden, they're not happy, right? The, these worms can cause anemia and such. We definitely want to control the worm burden. But having a few worms, I want to argue, can really help us control our immune systems. So this is a life cycle of one of the most prevalent worms. So this uh, species is Ascaris lumbricoides. I'll show you an actual photo of the worm in just a moment. This, this infects around 800 million people on Earth right now. Um, so these worms, uh, there's a, a female and a male that made up in the gastrointestinal tract of these 800 million humans. Um, they lay eggs that get passed out with the feces. They develop in the environment. And if somebody else ingests that embryonated egg, if the hygiene cycle, uh, if the hygiene does not break the cycle, um, somebody ingests that embryonated egg, the larvae migrate around. It's a crazy sci-fi. They go through the lungs, coughed up and swallowed. It's like... It's quite a story. But anyway, they, they end up in the, the, the small intestine where they then try to find a mate and the life cycle is complete, okay? Um, so these worms in particular, the adult worms of this species are known to live at least one year, if not a few years, inside the human body. And they're among the shortest live of worms that infect people. Some of the worms that infect people live 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, there are worms that live for decades inside human body. Okay, so I'm telling you all of this because it then is no surprise that worms are good at messing with the immune system, right? For their own survival in the bodies of hosts and promoting their own reproduction, the longer they live in that host, the more eggs they can pop out. They suppress the immune system for their own benefit but it has some collateral benefits for us in terms of modulating uh, inflammatory risks. It turns out that the molecules that are secreted day in, day out by worms reduce the risk that too many excited neutrophils will leave the blood vessels. This is my way of saying it dampens down the inflammatory reactions. So immunologists have really come around to this in the last decade or so. Um, to say that human immune systems are really calibrated over evolutionary time to the presence of old, old friends like this. Basically, our immune systems are wired so that we are compensating for the immunosuppression that has always been there since our immune systems evolved. This is now an actual photo of an Ascaris lumbricoides. They're about as long as a ruler-ish. Um, and I thought that was the friendliest looking worm, although people may quibble, but it's kind of giving a worm hug, right? <laughs> so this, remember, this is, this is a worm that as long as you don't have too many, it can provide anti-inflammatory benefits. So what's becoming increasingly clear is that mammals probably need a few worms uh, or a dose of worm goodies uh, for optimal performance. I put germs in here too because I haven't mentioned them at all, but the diversity of microbes in the gut is of course increasingly appreciated as being essential to optimal health as well, right? Sort of in the last 15 years or so, it's been, in, it's now in the New York Times almost every weekend, um, how important it is to have the right diversity and composition of, of microbes in your gut too. The, you, the, the, gastrointestinal tract is healthier. So I put them up here too. I don't mean to discount the germs, but worms and germs together help train and rein in the immune system so that neutrophils can get on with ingesting the parasites, ingesting the microbes like this one is doing, but damping down the risk of things like septic shock. 
So given our long evolutionary history with these anti-inflammatory friends, it may be that we are just not very well suited to this type of environment. I don't think any of us would say that Times Square was particularly hygienic, but it does, um, it's not a favorable environment for acquiring worm infections uh, that could keep your immune systems happy. Now, we're not alone in, in this. Uh, it turns out that other species have some of these same dependences on on uh, the presence of natural worms and germs. So for example, cotton top tamarins, these South American uh, primates, they have really bad inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's disease symptoms. They can even die from it, but it turns out that that only happens when they're in captivity. So it's only when they're in zoos, when they are away from the natural transmission cycles in the rainforest where they would have otherwise acquired their worms and germs. Another example is also a zoo animal. There was this beloved polar bear um, in Berlin named Newt, and he died very suddenly of an autoimmune encephalitis that many people do exhibit, but no wild animals have ever been known to exhibit. Um, he lived in that zoo for 30 years, and so people are investigating whether um, the absence of worms in his gut could have been part of why he succumbed to this inflammatory type of disease. Um, Anyone who wants to volunteer to study um, wild polar bears, please do let me know. People are shy about that for understandable reasons. But we're really at the dawn of this in terms of understanding how many species on Earth has share this susceptibility to inflammatory disease that we have and who are healthier when they have a few worms. Uh, we have reason to believe it should be very broad. It should be very widespread among animals. Research groups like mine, I'm by no means the only one, we are studying this across a spectrum of host wildness. That's what's um, cartooned here. So originally, uh, lots of biomedical immunologists who wanted to discover wonderful details of how neutrophils and other cells of the immune system function, they would focus only on studying lab mice. So basically, really clean inbred lab mice who live in um, uh, sterilized shoe boxes. Um, as a model for how our immune systems work. Now, we've learned a lot from that, but that cannot be the only way we study immune systems if we're going to understand um, the, the story that I've told you this evening. We need to understand domestic animals, captive animals, all the way across, feral animals, right through over to wild, and truly wild animals, how their immune systems function, how they balance the power and the peril of their immune responses, if we're going to really understand. Um, how our immune systems function when they succeed and when they fail. Um, human environments, of course, span some of this range as well, right? Times Square might be more at sort of towards the left of this spectrum, um, but plenty of human habitations span across to the right. What can we learn from that variation in environment in terms of inducing health? So just to return briefly to this plot, just to kind of close the loop on it, what I'm saying is that we think excessive hygiene, by which I mean total removal of worms from our guts and depletion of many of the healthy germs too, excessive hygiene may have shifted us up the cost axis on this plot. We're having a lot more costly side effects of our immune systems in such a clean world. Now this naturally suggests, should we reworm? Should we push back the other way? Change our environments like so? And I'd be delighted afterwards to talk to people about some studies that seem promising, where reworming is actually underway and it looks like it can really help with especially symptoms of things like ulcerative colitis. My own group, um, one of our approaches, if I can get the slide to advance, yes, is to use the laboratory mice, but put them back outside. Basically ask, can we take biomedicine's super clean lab mouse, the city mouse going back out into the countryside, quite literally, it's a New York City set of mice that we took to the New Jersey farms. <laughs> they get to run around on straw instead of living in that clean shoe box. They dig their own burrows. We were super proud of them for managing that. They drink dew, et cetera. Um, and we find when we reworm them and re-germ them by having them dig in the dirt and all that sort of thing, we find that the mice and their, especially the um, 
the immune responses in their guts. They are inflammatory bowel disease prone genotypes we've even studied out there, and it's ameliorated. It's much better when they're rewormed and regermed outside. So uh, be delighted to talk to people about more of that later. Okay, I, know I need to wrap up. So um, I want to give a synopsis where I sort of pull this back together um, and then think about how we might actually inform medical treatments in, in the near future. Basically, how can we maximize the power while minimizing the peril of these immune weapons we have? With neutrophils being a prime example, but by no means the only example we could have focused upon. Okay, so you can tell I'm very enthusiastic about neutrophils, but I do think they're amazing, right? Um, I, I sure think so. They pack both the power to clear anthrax and the danger of killing us if they in, um, induce septic shock. The ancient defense mechanisms that uh, arose from history of life on Earth, they're reined in by old friends like parasitic worms that have been with us for 400 and some million of the years of our, co of our evolution. And it's only very, very recently, like last 100 years at most, that people have begun living without our old friends. And this seems to be causally associated with a higher risk of inflammatory disease. So I argue that the future of medicine may very well be these rewormings and regermings. Uh, from an ecologist's perspective, you could call it the restoration ecology of the human gut. You know, people talk about the restoration ecology of the estuaries, right, around the rivers here, that sort of thing around the seashore. Uh, we could talk about the restoration ecology of the human gut. I think this is, I think, supposed to be super poop because it's, um, it's associated, it's an ad for um, considering fecal transplants as a way of re-germing. And I, as many of you probably know, this is considered the best treatment for a persistent C. difficile infection. You re-germ and get those microbes, natural microbes in there to outcompete the d disease causing ones. Reworming experiments, though, are also underway, especially with this whipworm, which is a uh, resident of the human colon, so it's a large uh, intestine resident, and it turns out to be really powerful at treating ulcerative colitis. Some of you who are skeptics about um, how lovable the worms are may say, why don't we just get harness what chemicals the worms produce and get the same effect without having to deal with the squiggly worm? And my mother says very much that same thing. She does not want worms. Um, um, but so far, only live worms do it because live worms provide a cocktail of drugs. They're not just secreting one thing. They're not secreting two. They're probably secreting about 25 things at a time. So they make a cocktail of anti-inflammatory compounds and also probiotic, as it happens. They could also cultivate the right germs in, that, in their proximity. Plus, because they live there for a year or two or 10 or 20, it's also like having an extended time release capsule, having a worm in your body. And so you can see that worms set a very high bar for pharmaceutical companies to match. So far, only the live worms do it. Okay, so I'll just show you the same slide again here at the end. I think that um, there's emerging evidence um, that our ancient evolved defenses work best in the presence of our old friends. There's much work yet to be done, especially to apply it in the clinic, but I really do think this is the future of medicine. So I want to thank you again for your attention, but also thank my collaborators uh, on the ecology of worm germ host interactions who helped me to develop these ideas and the funding agencies that support my research. And with a final set of worms, I will thank you again for your attention and take any questions.